Before we knew it, we were being diverted into a cattle mart. There's police everywhere. There's a helicopter, there's dogs. I had two bold tires. I had no tax, no MOT, no insurance, and I didn't have a driving license. I, I was brought up complete atheist. That night, as I put my head down on the pillow, this little voice in my head said, that's your last chance. At that moment, everything changed. One of the key attributes that he gave me was a good work ethic. He said, son, you don't get anything in this life unless you earn it. I didn't know that was his way of showing me love by teaching me what it meant to be a man. And then at 16, getting encouraged to join the mill. And then all of a sudden you're out and you're looking around for something to belong to. But I didn't know where to turn. I just got into the routine of going to the pub all the time. What I really wanted to talk about was that dark place that I was in the last time me and you were together in the original studio. Right, welcome to this edition of the debrief where I have a legend of our own drive time show, the oh, fruit cake. Fruit cake, how are you, mate? <laughs> right. How you doing, was, that, was that the intro you expected? I, I promised you a decent intro, mate. So is that was that no. good enough? Or would I you like me to do it again? It, mate. You went over and above the college. Over and above, that that's one. exactly. Unrelenting pursuit of excellence. You know that, I know that. Yes, right. Um I know that, mate. <laughs> let's crack on with it, shall we? Let's um let, let's go back and let's find out about the cupcake, the the small fruit cake. The little was. fruit cake. Yeah, little fruit cake. Let's go back little into fruit, fruit cakesville and find out about a small fruit cake. Wow, mate. Uh, the little fruit cake was never that little. I mean, from from the get go. It was it was a painful affair for the mother. Let's be was it? Were, was you a, never... were, you a, were you a were you a handful? Let's put it that way. I was I was a handful, mate. And yeah, yeah. Extra couple of stitches for your mother then. Oh, don't don't <laughs> I don't even want to think about being there, mate. Let's no. be honest. <laughs> Goodness, nah, mate. Yeah, born in Leeds in Yorkshire. Leeds. Yes. So I'm a northerner in blood, but I was dragged down south, kicking and screaming. How old were you when you was dragged down south? Through three. Oh right, don't, okay. So you don't, you don't really have any interest. you don't really have any Leeds memories or anything like that, no? No. Well, all my relatives are still up there. So we oh, okay. go up there for weddings and bar mitzvahs, that sort of thing, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, all all of my relatives are Leeds, um, Pudsey, um, all that sort of area. So me Do you know me, a place called Tingley, dear? Do you know Tingley? Tingly, no. Yeah, little place called Tingly. There's a Chinese. He's outside of Leeds. There's a Chinese. I just mentioned it because I like the Chinese. There, that's all. That's just totally a, just a, <laughs> just to distract you a little bit. Who who would have thought that out of everything in Yorkshire and Super Leeds United, the one thing that you remember is a Chinese restaurant at Tingly? Yeah, <laughs> Tingly Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, maybe, maybe you should hit them for a bit of advertising, mate. Maybe, maybe, advertising. maybe we should. Maybe they'll sponsor me or something like that. Oh, Big Phil Campion hey. sponsored by Tingly Chinese. Free Chinese. <laughs> and you know, what, you know what stands out the most for me? They all had Northern accents. And all. <laughs> <laughs> mate, there's nothing funnier than seeing a Chinese man with a broad Yorkshire accent, you know. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> aye. So, yeah, drag down wow, south. Wow, 10 wild 2. 10 wild 2 was, was tinky time. <laughs> hey, stop it. We'll get canned, mate, straight away. <laughs> Go on, so, then, right, yeah, let's bring it. Um, let's, let's get a fruitcake back, back on track. Yeah, back down south. To the Cotswolds. Don't turn me into a southern softy. So they dragged me into a farming community, a tiny little farming community. Do you remember whereabouts? Where, whereabouts were you in the Cotswolds? Well, um, my parents quickly <laughs> divorced after that. Okay. Yes. So, um, yeah. So my mum was left fending for me and my other brother. And um, she she did what she had to do just to, to provide, to get by. And uh, then my stepdad came along, Steve. And he was um, Forrester, a woodsman. And um, Steve came, and I know you'll relate to this. He came from, he came from child services, foster care. 
kicked from one home to another to another into these establishments for, you know, kids yeah. that no one wanted. And he was from, and that was round Bristol, round Brizzle. So he was brought up round there, dotted about, and that that guy, he he was he was um he never spoke about his younger years. He right, was okay. very he didn't want to talk about it. Um and my dad is very like what would you say, Victorian principles that Children should be seen and not heard and yeah. um, stop crying. I'll give you something to cry about. It was just a hard bloke brought up in a hard environment. And yeah. I'll, I'll never forget, I was about 14 because I really understood what he was saying to me. And he told me this one story. He was with um, a foster family and they had children of their own. And it came to Christmas and every all the family were under the tree. And my dad was there. I don't know what age he was, like six, seven, something like that. But he said all the kids were opening up their presents and he got his one present. And he had been nervous with this family and he, he had an accident. And he didn't know what to do with his underpants. So he hid, oh, wow, them, okay. in the air, he hid them in the airing cupboard. And guess right. what? He opened this present and it was a pair of his shitty pants. And that, no that, was the, that was the sort of environment that he was brought up in. And that was the one story that stuck in my head. Not all the hidings and the beatings that he got in the establishments, but this one. Yeah, no, that's, that's, deep, that's deep stuff. That, isn't it? That's pretty honking, isn't it? you know what I mean? I mean yeah. It's... So yeah. you can imagine that this kind of made him the man that he became. Very self-sufficient, self-reliant. He was working as a woodsman, like I said, at the age of 16, doing piecework, just working with a chainsaw all day. He was ripped to smithereens. And he's, and he's, one of the key attributes that he gave me was a good work ethic. And he said, son, you don't get anything in this life unless you earn it, unless you work for it. No, you're right. Like, well, anything worth having anyway, do you know what I mean? So. <laughs> hardest working man I ever met. At one point, trying to bring me and my brother up, uh, he'd taken on an instant family. Yeah. And then, then my youngest brother was born, three kids on a very low wage he was working four jobs a week. He used to, he was out of the house eight o'clock in the morning doing his forestry work. He'd come home, have his dinner at five o'clock, and then he was at the quarry, mining in the quarry from six o'clock till 10 o'clock. And he did that Monday to Friday, and then Jeez. weekends he, he worked as well. And he took me along with him on the Saturday and Sunday to work with him. So, what kind he, of work was that? What, what, what was the Saturday and Sunday? More chopping trees and stuff? Or? Saturday and Sunday, there was, it was like a manor. In the heart of the Cotswolds, beautiful place um, near Borton on the Water. Now, this manor was beautiful. A couple, of, an old couple. They had lots of money. They were from London. This was their weekend home. Yeah. And they employed me and my dad to do everything around the estate. So whether or not it was clearing trees, clearing brushes, planting stuff, building bridges, just outdoorsy, hands on. My dad taught me how to mixed two stroke and how to sharpen a chainsaw and you know just stuff that a father passes to his son and yes yeah my dad my dad i call him my dad he was my dad he brought me yeah. up he's my dad um and it was just i didn't appreciate it at the time i hated getting up on a saturday while all my mates were out playing in the park or you know smooching with their girlfriends you know and, and all that sort of stuff but Saturday and Sunday, I worked with my dad, and I, I never, I never forget. One time, we came back from work and I had me wellies on, and my trousers were all covered in dirt, and we were going shopping, you know, the big shop yeah. on a Friday. And he said, "Right, son, we're off." And I was like, "Dad, I, I want to change out." No, son, we're going right now. I said, "Dad, I'm covered in muck. You'd be proud that you're covered in muck, son." I didn't appreciate it at the time, mate. Yeah. I thought I looked like a dick in my dirty clothes and dirty welly boots. But my dad had this thing about a hard-working mindset. So I didn't appreciate it. 
I didn't know what it was. I didn't know that was his way of showing me love by teaching me what it meant to be a man. So I, I harbored this resentment and this, I mean, he, he, he was a, he was a, he was a strict man. <laughs> I'm not going into any details, mate. Yeah. Cause we'll get into this later on. And he wouldn't let it go. You, you know, if you stood up, you, you know, you never stood up. You just took it. Yes, sir. And you, that was it. So it was, it was strict. Yeah. But he never told me that he loved me. Those were the words that I never, I never realized that he loved me. I never thought he loved me, you know, growing up 13, 14, 15. And then at 16, getting, well, encouraged to join the mill. So that was yeah. it. I was out of the house. I was out of his hair. I was gone, done. So that relationship was really strained. And in my head, I was glad that I was away from that. And, yeah. you know, someone screaming at you in basic training, you know, I'll shove my pace stick up your ass and ride you around the drill square like a shagging pogo stick. That didn't bother me. Yeah. That didn't bother me at all because I'd had, a, I'd had far worse. So, so puff and wind anyway. That, that pace stick's going nowhere near your backside. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. I don't even worry about it. <laughs> if, if my dad had said it to me, guess what? Yeah. Yeah. He would have gone through guess, with it. Guess what? I'm <laughs> running. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember getting a beating. Well, I got a good hiding for ducking one time. He went to give me a smack and I moved out of the way and he got his hand trapped in a sheet net. Electric fence. <laughs> he got a jolt and he gave me a bollocking for moving. <laughs> anyway, so so we fast forward, come out of the mill, and it was, I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know, you've got this, you know when to get up, why to get up, who, yeah. what, when, why. You've got this, this routine you're used to it, and then all of a sudden you're out and you you look around and you've got no safety net, you've got no brothers. You're in Sibby Street and you're looking around for something to belong to because you've been in this family for so long, part of something, and you need to belong. You feel again. So what do you see? You see, I saw the pub. I saw the pub. Everyone seemed everybody was having a good time. Everyone's happy. I thought, you know what? I just got into the routine of going to the pub all the time. Now, local pubs or downtown? Little... Hey? Local pubs or downtown? Local country bumpkin, large village, small town. Yeah, 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 yeah. And everybody knew your business. They knew my business. They knew where I'd come from. They knew I, I, I boxed in the army and. I've never lost a fight and all that. And then after a few ciders, people, they want to have a crack of the title and, you know, they want to knock you down a peg or two. And you're, you're, you're now trying to get into Sibby Street, but you're still back. How long did it take for you, you to stop, for the dreams to stop that you were actually still in the mill? They're still there. Oh, really? You still yeah. dream like you're in the mill and you wake yeah. up and your heart sinks. Yeah, I dreamt last night that I went to the armory. Seriously. So that's, yeah, it still happens to me almost every day. Wow. Dude, and it's hard. It's like you win the lottery and then you wake up and it's all a dream. That sinking feeling that you don't have that safety net, that brotherhood. So anyway. Try to find it in drink. Did some crazy things. We, we, you could be violent. You could, you, you could be violent, being poked the wrong way. And you don't have that, that leash, that, that, okay, do you know what? I'm just going to step back. For me, I thought it was a sign of weakness. If you step back now... 30 years later, 25 years later, I know it's certainly not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength being able to say, do you know what? But then I didn't feel that. So long story short, I knew that drink wasn't good for me. Having that aggressive nature, 
and drink and it just kind of it just made it worse man it just it just made it worse so i, I needed another group to belong to and um I, I i saw these guys with their their lowered motors and their and the tunes and you know and i could wire up an amp or two and and you know i got on well with these guys and they smoked a, a bit of pot and i'd never really been into that mate i was into no. sports and all that but i never saw them involved in any violence or any aggression they always seemed to be happy and i just i just i just put that mask on so i became a party animal bit of a raver bit of a cheesy quaver and you know <laughs> going out <laughs> giving it all that um but it didn't stop at pot and that was the that was the problem it took me it took me down that road, and ultimately, I spent two and a half years sticking coke up my nose, taking class A, B, C drugs, and yeah, that'll do it. That that does you all the favors in the world, doesn't it? No. Yeah, really, really <laughs> good for the noggin, really. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and and I remember one night, I I'm glad it happened a long time ago because I'm I'm going to divulge stuff. I I was um. We used to meet up on a Friday night in a Tesco car park and there used to be like 100, 150 cars and we'd all travel in convoy one after the other. Not knowing where we were going, but that was part of the fun. That was part yeah, of yeah, the yeah, gig. Yeah. And we'd eventually end up in a field in the middle of nowhere, illegal rave. Uh, you know, DJ G. Geddes would love all this and Sophie D, they'd be all over it, you know. <laughs> uh, but this particular night, we'd been travelling, we'd be driving for about an hour and... We're driving into a town called Stroud, and before we knew it, we were being diverted into a cattle market. It was a big cattle market off the main road, and we looked around. There's police everywhere. There's a helicopter. There's dogs. I don't know how many police. There, there must have been. There must have been twenty vehicles there, and I, they called it Operation Haystack. Now car in front of me was being searched and the car behind me was being searched and I was stuck in the middle in my little Volkswagen Golf GTI little boy racer motor and they must have found something on the driver in front because a policeman came and got in the driving seat and moved the car out of the way and then another a new policeman drove me forward and then he tapped on the window he said Sir, can I see your documentation? And the problem was I didn't have I had two bold tires, I had no tax, no MOT, no insurance, and I didn't have a driving license. Oh, you grand slammed it. You've done all right. Ah, but wait, I've got <laughs> cherry to go on top of this bad boy. Um, my mate had about 50 pills on him, and I had nine ounces all cut up in wraps ready to get rid of so taps on the window i wind the window he says can i see your documentation sir i said your colleagues already searched my car he said he had to move that car out of the way so that i could move on right and sir have a good night and he just woke Ooh. me on and i just and i just drove i just drove off mate wow i didn't, I didn't continue on this convoy i'll be honest with you mate my ass was like that so yeah, 50 pence a pound, mate. That's horrible, yeah. Dropped my mate off home, and I got home, and I was living with my parents while I was saving up to get my own pad. And that night, as I put my head down on the pillow, this little voice in my head say, said, that's your last chance. That's your last chance. And you know what? I listened to that voice. And yeah, from yeah, that yeah. moment on, I woke up that morning and I began to change my life around. I stopped doing all chemicals. Admittedly, I smoked a bit of pot for a few months after that. But me, me, me and this small group of friends, we did everything together. We were thick as thieves. And my dad kicked me out of the house because he thought I'd stolen his CD player out of his boat and sold it to my druggy mates. I hadn't. But he wasn't listening to it. And I think the late nights, me coming home in the middle of the night, 
me not showing respect, me, you know, just yeah. being a lad and, be, and and the crowd that I was with, my dad just wanted. So he booted me out. At the time, really hurt. And I thought, you know what? B- balls to you. I, I'd given <laughs> you the opportunity to show me love and respect. And he, he, he kicks me out of the house. And, and, and that, to an extent, enforced in my head the bitterness that I held in towards my dad, my stepdad. So I'm a grown-ass man now. I can make my own life to hell with him. And that was how, that's how it stood for, for a long time. He booted me out. And I thought, you know what, I just, I don't, I'm better off away from that. So, you know, we can fast forward a couple of years. I'd say I cleaned me act up, but me and a mate who'd been doing everything together, he he went to the doctors because he was suffering in his head. And I was I was the same. And it was it was like um it was like you were in a daydream. Like everything wasn't quite real. It was like a, a bit hazy in your head. And we had the exact same symptoms anyway. He got diagnosed with um, intoxia psychosis brought on by the, the lack of the drugs that you've been doing. So these episodes would last to start off with like for a week. You'd feel, ooh, no one would think you're off your head, but it felt like that feeling you get, and you might, you probably don't know, Phil, because you weren't like that. But when you're coming up on LSD, it's that transition between you don't feel normal, but you don't feel trippy. You're just in this phasey bit. And that's how it felt, mate, for like a whole week. And then Jeez. just out of nowhere, click, complete clarity. And it's like, oh, I'm all right now. And then two hours later, bang, you're back in this. And so over time, what happened was, say, eventually it was like one day on, one day off, one day on, one day off. And then it was one day a week. And then it was one day every two weeks, one day a month. And it, and it made years, years it took for this, this thing. I, was, I wasn't depressed. I wasn't unhappy. I, I was getting on with my life. But there was something that had changed the, the chemical balance in my head because of doing all that, that crazy stuff in the past. So yeah. it has a long lasting effect on you, but it was just me trying, trying on a different mask, mate. It was me wanting to excel and, and get a pat on the back and, you know, I, I can do the most drink. I can do the most drugs. I'm, you know, that it was that sort of, when I left the mill, I felt like I needed to prove myself. Yeah. It, it was, it, it was, a, it was a real, it was a real head melter, a real, a real problem. And, um, yeah, it kind of, it kind of stuck with me for years, this wanting to be the best or to be noticed. And uh, it was, it, it was just, it was just a crazy time. And, so how old were you then? How, how, old, how old were you when all this was going on? Well, from 26 to 28. So I'm now... So fairly young in terms of how old Fairly young, but yeah. old enough to know better, yeah? Yeah. You know, old So when did you know... finally break away from all that sort of stuff? And I think, right, I've wife. got a... Okay, I met right, my okay. Wife. I met my wife. She's from here. I'll say where here is. Yeah. I, I've settled in Northern Ireland. She's from okay. Northern Ireland. We met um, in the Cotswolds. Uh, I hadn't well, drank. I hadn't drank for two years, mate. I was completely teetotaled. Me and my little brother, we used to we used to go out every night because he didn't drink. But we used to we used to go out to the clubs and we party and dance. But there was no drink. There was no hangover. There was no stupidness. Yeah, we we knew exactly what we're doing. Laughter and joking wasn't, it wasn't forced. It, you, you, you know what I mean? You get into a group of lads and we're all drinking, and sometimes there's a competition who can be the loudest sort of thing. And yeah, 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 I get there that. Was, yeah. 
There was none of that, mate. Um, me and my little brother, my my middle brother, he was in the household cavalry. So he was there, you know, playing with horses and um, you know, and <laughs> he was a he was a PTI and a tailor in at Knightsbridge. Okay. So he was he was down there, and me and my little brother, we went on holiday. We went to Crete. We went to Malia. You imagine going to Malia to eat totaled? <laughs> I can't. I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been over to all these sorts of places, but I've never not drank when I've gone there. But mate, it was so refreshing, and it I, was I was so going because I did have a, I had a large period last year for eight months where I didn't drink at all. And I actually, remember. Actually, yeah. you can go out and still have a good laugh, but the the best thing for me was there's no hangover, is there? If you don't drink, there's no hangover, and hangovers are absolutely honking. My biggest problem was the hangover and forgetfulness of how much of I, I was a dick. Yeah. Because Facebook wasn't around at the time, thankfully. Yeah. I'm very grateful social media. I think we had Friends you Reunited. That friends was about Reunited, it. yeah. Friends Reunited. We had that, <laughs> mate. That was about it. So, yeah. And and being just getting to know my little brother because my little brother was like eight nine years younger than me. Right. Okay. So when I'm growing up, when I joined the mill at sixteen, he's he's still a child. You know, yeah, we had nothing yeah. in common. But then it was later on in life that we got to know each other and we got to hang out and I got to know what made Terry tick and and it was fantastic and I'm so grateful for those memories. You know why. Um, and we'll come to that that shortly. I'm I've no doubt. So I meet my beautiful wife Jackie, little Irish girl, um, and I just I just knew she was so. She's going to watch this, so I'm not. <laughs> she was she, she was so right for me. She was so right that within six months we were sitting down on CAD on a computer screen designing our house that we were going to build together in the middle of Northern Ireland, in the middle of a field, in the middle of nowhere, and we were going to start a family. We, I, I knew within six months that this was the woman I wanted to spend the rest of my life with, mate, because she was so, so right for me. I didn't feel like I needed to perform. She, she comes from a real... Her family are very traditional. You might know Northern Ireland. It does feel like it's the land that time forgot. They're about 10, 15 years behind. And that's a great thing because generally... Yeah, that's a nice thing. I do like that. I do like places like that. If I've been over to the province recently and it is, you know, you can still go in pubs and stand up and have a drink. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's different, isn't it? They, they don't, yeah. they haven't seen to have caught up with some of the stupidity yet. Well... Generally, people over here would give their shirt off their back if they thought it would help you out. They're, they love family. Family is a big thing. And no one gives a monkeys about how big your TV is or how fast your car is or, you know, that materialistic materialism. Maybe because my family are a, a, a country as opposed to towny, but still it reminded me of my childhood being brought up in the countryside and those sort of values of fran family and connection and it didn't matter how big your tv was um really really appealed to me mate i, I love my in-laws um to bits like you know um it's such a blessing to be over here you know yeah we we, we all think we know what northern ireland's about but i am telling you right now as you probably know but i'm telling all of our lovely viewers, that Northern Ireland is a beautiful, beautiful place. The north coast of Antrim is stunning. It's spectacular, and it still blows me away. 20 years later, when I get on that bike and I ride that north coast, and you've got Bushmills Distillery, that's a good start, huh? but yeah, yeah, yeah. Bushmills Distillery and that Causeway Coast and the Giants Causeway and Port Rush and Port Stewart and all that, and you know what? It's still affordable to buy a house on the coast, in the in a field in the middle of nowhere, on the coast, looking at the sea. You get that for 150 grand. Yeah, you, that's incredible, you, isn't it? That is incredible. You try getting a garage for that in in England <laughs> for 100. And of course, you get you get you get you get a, you get an Ulster fry over there. I, I had an Ulster fry recently, 
And that, that is, that's a thing of beauty, isn't it? <laughs> it's a pro Mate, I came over here, I was 12 stone. <laughs> I, I you did all never... oh, seriously. You put a lot of weight on, didn't you? You had put yeah. a lot of weight on at one stage, didn't you? Yeah, I was 23 stone at one stage, mate. Yeah, I was a good chunky monkey, but... What are you, you down know, to now? 18, 17 and a half, something like that. Yeah, that's an incredible journey. That's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot off. but I've got this to blame for it, you know. I never wanted to be a skinny bloke. I never wanted no. to be. So I like being called big man. I like I like the idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where I work, it's nice to be called big man, you know. It, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, came over here, married, first daughter. Um, my wife got rushed to hospital. Um, and she really struggled in hospital. Right. Um, and she, with tears in her eyes, it was awful. It was awful that I'm, I'm a fixer. I'm a, I'm an engineer. I like to be able to fix stuff. I'm a fixer. That's what I do. You give me a problem. I will find you a solution and we will fix this. And I kind of always had that sort of mentality and mindset in my head. <clears throat> I like fixing stuff. But I couldn't fix this. And my wife looked at me with tears in her eyes, man. And she said, can you make it stop? I, I, I mean, and it just, and there was nothing I could do. She was rushed into theatre. Obviously, the baby wasn't coming out the way that it should. And yeah. I remember being sat in the hospital waiting room, waiting to find out if my wife made it or if my child made it or if both made it or both of them didn't make it. And being a, a fixer, I, I, was, I was trapped. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything about it, mate. And you know what? I, I looked out the window and I went like this. I went, God, are you ready for this? God, if you're there, I don't believe you are. But if you are, would you save my, my wife and my child? And I felt nothing, uh, nothing more. That was all I had. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't go yeah, in there. Nothing. Yeah, you've, you've reached your LOE. I, I reached, I was on my knees, um, metaphorically. And half an hour later, a woman came up, said, um, congratulations, Mr. Stevens, you're, you're father of a newly born baby girl. And um, I said, how's my wife? She said, she's in recovery. She'll, she'll be out soon. So I went out into the, the little area where all the babies are. And there was my little Hannah, named her Hannah. Um, and, and the nurse said, you could hold her if you want. And I said, I don't know if this feels right. My wife should be the first one to hold our child for some reason in my head. And mm. the nurse said, no, it would be good for her. So I picked her up and I held her. And you know what? At that moment, ev every everything, everything changed from what I thought was important in my life. At that moment, everything changed. And I knew that I had a mission and I had a purpose and there was a reason for me. To be a dad. Yeah. To, yeah, be, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, to, to be a good dad. To break the family curse. I call it the family curse. My mum and dad split up. Their mum and dad split up. Their mum and dad. It was hereditary. And no Stephen's family had got my, my, my other brother was on his fourth wife. <clears throat> and my youngest brother was just thinking about getting married sort of thing and settling down. And I, I knew that I, I, this was so important to me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Jackie comes out and there's, we got photos of her. She was still off her head, like with Hannah on the diddy and me taking photos, proud father. My, my wife's eyes are like crossed. Sort of, <laughs> sort of that was her introduction to motherhood. She can't remember the first day. Like. Can't remember really? the first day. So, um, yeah, she's in hospital for a while, a few days. Um, and Jackie's granny, sadly no longer with us. She came and 
you know, this was her first grandchild. Yeah. And she bought this little porcelain boot with a little porcelain badge on it, a little cross, beautiful little thing. And it said, Jesus loves you. Now, I got very defensive. And I, I I was brought up complete atheist. Didn't believe in God. I thought Christians were people who were too weak to believe in themselves. So God was like a crutch that they could they could hobble through life on. Yeah. I just I just thought I thought it was like Santa Claus and like the Tooth Fairy. It was just nice stories, like Aesop's fables. These stories about Jesus. That sort. Of, I just thought they were nice stories. Like, so I mocked Granny and her little, her lovely little boot. And I actually said to my wife later on when she was coming out of hospital, I said, you know what? If you put that up in our house, I'm going to put an inverted crucifix up just to balance it all out. Because sure, it's just a sign, isn't it? That was how anti, even though I, you know, a week before I cried out to God, I didn't believe. I didn't think I was actually talking. I didn't I didn't believe, mate. So life goes on, mate. I didn't put an inverted crucifix up just to, no, I'm <laughs> just, so, <laughs> just so you know, mate. No, there's no dark spirits in me, mate. So we're fast forward a year later, and um I'm in the gym, full of test full of growth hormone, getting big, getting strong, benching more than anybody, showing off, pushing reps of 100 kilos, like <laughs> yeah. 10 sets of 10, 100 kilos. I'd kill myself doing that now. Anyway, I um, I was on a rack, just like that one. I was squatting and my knee went, my knee went pop. And I, and I, and I dropped the weight. Luckily, it was on a Smith's machine. Dropped the weight, and I hobbled out of the out of the gym, mate. Hobbled out of that place, and I went home. And um, I thought, how am I going to get my kick now, man? How am I going to get my buzz? Because that was that was where I went to 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 relieve stress. Yeah. You know, I'm a new father of a of a, of a child, and and the baby's crying a lot, and my wife's giving it all that and work is and just any excuse i need the gym i need i just need to de-stress and i wasn't getting it so i am um, one morning oh one morning i came out to sort my chickens out and they'd all been eaten they'd all been bit heads ripped off and i knew who it was my next door neighbor his dog, because I'd seen his dog around the pens a few times. And I went down there full of anger, full of rage, full of test. So half seven in the morning, I'm banging on the door. Bearing in mind, I was, I was, I was a big chunky monkey at the time. Like, not that I'm small now, mate, but big, big. And I banged on the door and I was, I was ready to, to unleash on the guy. Anyway, he answered the door. He was such a nice bloke, an English bloke as well. And there, there aren't many of us over here. Long story short, I ended up inviting him to my house to watch the match that night, have a few beers. <laughs> and we got on like a house on fire. He, first thing he did, he offered to buy new chickens and, and, and all that. He was really sorry, really heartfelt sorry. Yeah. Um, anyway, we got on really well. And... Um, Maybe a couple of weeks into it, his wife came up and uh, and my wife and his wife got on really well. And anyway, <clears throat> one day we're at our dining room table in the kitchen and he told me he was a Christian. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, I'm a Christian. What? You're one of those one of those weirdos. And I just I just mocked him. I just mocked. That's all. That's all I could do. Yeah. And me from this background of. You know, you're taught at school that we evolved from single-celled amoebas over billions of years, and we've evolved from monkeys, and, and your ancestor's a monkey, and mine is a monkey. And you remember the picture of the caveman and, he, you know, a fish, yeah. and then, you know, you become yeah, a human yeah, yeah, the evolution one, yeah. Yeah. 
and that's that's what I believed. And I thought it was really strange in this day and age that a grown man would believe in God and Christ and not realise that they're just stories from this old book and they're irrelevant now. So I thought, anyway. So I have this injury on my knee and it's a Saturday afternoon and I'm sat there drinking my Strongbow. Saturday afternoon, fag in one hand, drinking my Strongbow. And um, Jason and Kelly come over on a Saturday afternoon and he said, um, I said, what you been at? And they said, oh, we've been praying for people in in Coleraine, on the streets. I was like, how, how does that work? He said, well, we just ask God and we ask Jesus to minister to these people and we've seen miraculous healings. And I'm like, yeah, all right, pull the other one. Whatever you want to believe, pal. Whatever you want to, whatever makes you happy. But then Jason says to me, I want to pray for you. I was like, nah, mate, you know, I'm not into that. He said, I really believe that God wants to touch you. And I said, where does God want to touch me? <laughs> Just, just disrespectful, being crude. Anyway, yeah. I eventually gave in, mate. I gave in. They, I sat down in the chair and they lifted my legs up and the compacted knee was about half an inch. My ankles didn't, didn't line up. You know what I mean? One was a yeah. little bit shorter, yeah, yeah, like yeah. half an inch shorter. Anyway. I must have been there, I don't know, five minutes, ten minutes. I, to start off with, I was really agitated because I just thought, I, this is nonsense, like this mumbo, mumbo jumbo. And then I just started to chill a bit. Anyway, they lifted my legs up and they were the same length. And I was like, dude, how, how did you do that? They said, Jesus did that. And I'm like, no, no seriously, how, how did you do that? That was Jesus. Oh, like, mate, look. That is the best party trick I've seen in my... I, I've, I've set fire to my farts. I've snorted a condom up my nose and gone like that. But that, that is spectacular. You've got to show me how you did that. And he just said, Jesus did that. And I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around it. I was like, well, you're either a liar, which... Or whatever. Anyway, so I get up go over to the fridge and I'm still in so much pain and I limp over to the fridge and I crack open a can of cider. I was like, well, he didn't do a very good job. I'm still hobbling along. And I went down to the bathroom and I sat on the toilet. I locked the door. And, you know, I said I spoke to God in that hospital. I did a similar thing and I went, I went, God, if that is you, you're going to have to try a damn sight harder than that. And I stood up and my knee went crack. You know when someone cracks a knuckle? Yeah. It was a knee, a knee-sized crack. And I walked out of that bathroom with no limp, no pain, no limp. And I, and I couldn't figure out. I, I, I couldn't understand how that happened. What was it? I just, I couldn't. And I, and I walked into the kitchen and I said to my wife, kind of reluctantly, I said, look, do you want to check out this church malarkey tomorrow? And my wife was like, I'd love to. I'd love to go. And I imagine Jason and Kelly high-fiving each other. Go Team Jesus. I, I, don't, I don't believe they did do that. But I imagine in my head, yay, Team Jesus, another one for Jesus. I hadn't made that. I just... I thought there's somewhat weird and I'd like to know if this is real or if it's just nonsense. So I walked into that church the following day. It's the 27th of March, 2005 for reference. So it was 18 years ago. So I walked into that church and it was a big Easter service and um, they were handing out these little cards at the door and they asked you to fill them out, A, B, C or D. And it said, A, I'm already a believer. B, I'm, cons no, A, I'm already a believer. B, I'm making the decision for the first time today. C, I'm considering it. Or D, never in a million years. And I ticked D, never in a million years and signed it Mickey Mouse. 
thinking I was funny. And I was like, that'll make them chuckle. So I took D, signed Mickey Mouse, and put it back in this little pot. So I'm in this church service, mate. And I I ain't been in a church service since I was a kid going to a CRE primary school, uh, you know, with the pews and the bloke dressed up in a dress, a black dress telling these Aesop fable stories about Jesus and how God's on a big white cloud and all that. Anyway, I got in there and the people were singing and there was guitars and all sorts. And, mate, something, something happened in that service because there was someone sharing his story, his testimony, he was talking about drugs and abuse and blah, blah, blah. And... There were people with their arms up in the air. And I looked around and there was a bloke who looked just like me. Real good looking bloke. Bold head. <laughs> goatee. I'm not having to do two of you. Real good looking bloke. I know his name now. I met him. And um, with tears rolling down his eyes. But with this, with a smile. He was crying. He was happy. He was that happy. Don't tell me you saw the Mickey Mouse note. Felt like a dick. So, so I said, I said to myself, I said, you know what? I'd love to have what that bloke's got. And that was when it happened. And that voice that warned me all those years ago about that enough was enough for the drugs. And that had guided me and that helped me. That voice said to me, you can have it. And at that moment, I knew I was wrong, mate. Like... I can't explain it, but yeah. I knew that I ticked the wrong box. I didn't know what it meant to be a Christian. I didn't know what a new creation is. I didn't know any of the, you know, the religious stuff. I still don't know the religious stuff, mate. 18 years on, thank God I'm not religious. But I, I knew that I was wrong. And I walked out of there and everything smelled different and looked different and tasted different. Mate, it was different. I know what it is now, but at the time I had no idea. All those masks fell away and I could just be who I am. I didn't have to big up myself. I didn't have to pretend to be someone that I'm not. And that was, the, that was the beginning of the rest of my life, mate. That was the biggest turning point in my life, mate. And that, 18 years ago, is, is still... So important to me. So important to me, mate. So do you still go do you still go to church now or do you just are you every, happy in the knowledge that you <laughs> every Sunday, mate. But the most okay, pleasurable right. most pleasurable thing in my life is seeing my daughter, Hannah, who's now twenty, leading worship at a youth group or at church. She's up there leading worship to and I know I don't we don't talk about this stuff, mate. No. I certainly, you haven't seen this side. You don't no. know. No, never. You don't know. We, we've, had, we've had some pretty deep conversations before. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I wanted to go deeper, but I didn't think it was the right time or the right place. Um, yeah. And I just, I didn't know how this conversation was going to go today, mate. I didn't know what I was going to talk about. Because I, I, what I really wanted to talk about was that dark place that I was in. The last time me and you were together in the original studio, and yeah. I don't know if you remember, but Johnny was recording it. I don't think it ever went out, mate. It was one of the most deepest personal conversations I've ever had with anybody. And me and you yeah. just talked about trauma. Because when my little brother committed suicide three years ago, that hit me. That knocked me for six. And then, yeah. can I say the owner of the company? Yeah, say name. Yeah, yeah, of course, can you? Yeah. So, so me and Scott had obviously known each other for an incredibly long time. <laughs> from from nineteen ninety. Anyway, so me and Scott. Scott's always had a few things on the go. And he's always had a few little businesses. They haven't always been successful. 
but he's a worker and he's a trier. And and when at the birth of Forceware, I actually named Forceware. We like we couldn't come up with a name, and I said Forceware, and yeah, it stuck. And he invited me to join Forceware right at the beginning, right at the birth of Forceware. Now, family commitments. And obviously the logistics of uh, traveling from Northern Ireland to London, it just wasn't, it wasn't practical. And we could never find a practical way for me to actually work with him. But yeah. the plan was we always would work together. We'd find a way. There would be a way. Now, so, so Forceware, it was great, absolutely fantastic. And then he decided, as you know, we're going to set up a media team. And that was where the idea Force Radio came about. So he invited me over to meet up with everybody and to talk about the logistics. And I remember I was, I was right in that pit of darkness, that anger, hatred, bitterness, all the feelings you shouldn't have as a Christian, right? Because... I'd lost my little brother and it was so, so hard. And there was a police investigation going on. There were allegations of this and that. And I had three police interviews. It was, I couldn't mourn. My, it felt like I couldn't mourn until we got yeah. the police investigation out of the way. And it was like nine months this investigation took. So I'm dealing with all this and Scott invites me over and I have to put this, I have to put this this front on that everything's okay, that I'm good, we're all great, life's brilliant, and I've been stuck in the cave for the past three months, on a knee, broken, waking up at three o'clock in the morning, coming into the gym just to get some sort of feeling, to try and get over this this anger, this hurt, this pain pain yeah this pain that i felt because i lost my little brother so coming over it was it was a big it was a big deal i i really hadn't chatted to anybody i was really wasn't i was nowhere near social media my youtube channel i'd i'd forgotten about that i just couldn't face it um and i had to ask someone and we're sat in the studio and I said, Phil, can me and you just have a chat? And I knew Johnny was going to record it, but I didn't, it, it wasn't going to go out. It was just, we didn't know what was going to happen. And I shared with you how I was feeling and your response. I didn't want anybody telling me how to feel. That's why I kept it to myself. I didn't want anybody telling me how I should mourn. I didn't want anybody telling me what I should do. And you didn't, you didn't. Your response wasn't pull yourself up, be a man, stop crying, just grab, just grow some balls. That wasn't your response. You remember your response to me was, Wayne, you have to talk about it. If you don't talk about it, you're not moving any further forward. You're going to be stuck. And that resonated in me because I couldn't even, I couldn't even think about talking about it. I, there, was, there, was no, there was no way that I could think about sharing it. So I took your advice, mate. I went and saw a counsellor, chatted to a stranger. I went and did a mental health first aid course to try and understand mental health. And you, brother, you you the one, I was on a knee, mate. And you're the one that extended your hand and helped me out of the cave. But it was that <laughs> first step. Yeah, I think that's that that's the one, and that's the what that's what we're all here for. We're here to talk to each other. Do you know what I mean? And I always say to everybody with this mental health thing, you've got to, A, acknowledge it, and then B, probably you'll speak to yourself before you speak to anybody else. 
But you've got to speak to someone at some stage of the campaign. You've got to get it out there. Do you know what I mean? And that's all you, that's, that's all you said. Well, you said a lot more, mate. <laughs> you, you spoke about your trauma. And I was like, you know what? We're not measuring uh, you, trauma you're not, here. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna ride this roller coaster through this life and not have something go wrong. Do you know what I mean? That's not the way it works. And it doesn't matter who you are and what you've got and where you've come from and who who's around you, at yeah. some stage you're yeah. gonna have to take a knee. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And it's gonna hit you, someone's gonna hit you, it's gonna be you know, something in your life is going to change to a point that's going to change your life as well. And that is when you've got to start talking about things and working out in your own head and all that sort of stuff. And if you can't yeah. do that, you know, you are going to you are going to be in a world of hurt. And then you start self-medicating and then the drugs come in. And then, do you know what I mean? If you like me, I'll start getting me fists a bit. You know what I mean? All that sort of stuff. Do you know what I mean? So, so as a result, mate, we can fast forward now. Um, part of a, a men's ministry at church where honesty and integrity is the most important thing, knowing that you've got a battle brother to your right and once you're left. And they know you and they're there for you. And when you need to take a knee, they're like an all-round defence. And you yeah. know that you're not alone, mate. And whether or not you do that as part of your social circle, part of a church group, I'm not, not telling everybody you need to go and join church, man. But you need to have, you need to have those battle brothers that know you so well that you can speak anything to them and there'll be no judgment, no condemnation, that they're there for you and they have your back. Mm. And that is the key to the mental health issue. If you're on your own and you're a lone wolf and you think you can do it on your own because you're hard, it's going to break you. It's yeah, I break. think everybody everybody needs somebody eventually. I I'm, I'm, I am adamant about that, you know. And I've been out on a limb before, as have you. Do you know what I mean? But you 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 got to get back in the fold at some stage. I believe anyway. Do you know what I mean? Otherwise, a hundred percent. What's the alternative, mate? You can't stay in the cave forever. You can't be a social hermit forever. You can't live inside your own thoughts forever. At one point, you're going to have to step out of that cave. And yeah, and it doesn't have to be a huge circle either. You know, for some people, it no. might just be purely as simple. It be my missus. Do you know what I mean? That's it, bust. That's that. That's where I want to talk. That's what. That, that's the person that understands me. Yeah. That's the person that's going to pick me back up. Yeah, and that's fine. That's up to you. Jazz. That's, that's your yeah. thing. But if you keep it inside, I liken yeah. it to putting about ten Mentos into a bottle of Coke and putting the lid on. At some stage, you got to take that lid off, off again. Yeah, exactly. At some stage, something's going to go bang, or you've got to get that lid off, and it's all going to come pouring out anyway. Do you know what I mean? So, do you know what I mean? It's, you've, got to, you've got to do something about it. Yeah, 100%, mate. And do you know what? This starting force radio and, and yourself and, and Johnny and Scott and obviously the other presenters, Wes, Wes likes to have a chat. Wes will have your back, like, you know, and Jason. Yeah, Wes, and Wes, can, Wes can have a chat, yeah. And, yeah like, and, we met Sophie as well. What a tremendous girl Sophie is. Do you know, incredible. Really, She's a I, proper, uh, she's a proper strawberry mivy, mate. She's a civvy, civvy, like, do you know what I mean? But what a lovely girl, do you know what I mean? I know. I FaceTimed her one night. She was in Berlin. She'd just come off stage. She gave me a guided tour. And, you know, mate, incredible. Yeah, she one. does some tremendous stuff, doesn't she? Tremendous stuff. Mate, I couldn't do it. I wouldn't ever want to see you do what Sophie does. I'm telling you now, dangling off a pole with half your clothes missing is not where I want to see the fruitcake. I'm going to tell you, all right? It would just have to be. I'm just going to throw that out there, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Reinforced scaffolding, mate. We'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> but look, let's talk. Let's talk about your. Let's talk about your show because, in the very beginning, I had to almost talk you into doing that show. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because you weren't sure. You that weren't. You were a bit sort of like, ooh, 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 shall I? Shall well, that I? was I, the problem, I mean? mate. That was the problem. I've been sat in the cave on a knee for months. Doubting myself, doubting who I was, doubting why I was there. I wanted to be a good husband. I wanted to be a good father. I couldn't let my guard down. I couldn't show my weakness in front of my children, in front of my wife. I'm the protector. I'm the one that looks after the family, mm. surely. So all of that in my head. And now you want me to talk? In front of people, two people, you off your head. And I remember saying, I don't need the drive time slot, mate. No, 
just give me a nice quiet little little bit. And I, I mate, I you, 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 we were we were going to give you mumbling around midnight. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I would have mumbling around that. midnight with the fruitcake. <laughs> I would have, I would have taken that, mate. I would have taken that. No but way. You, you was, you was, you was made for the drive time, mate. You was made for the drive home. It turns out you're quite right. Yeah, <laughs> you're not. Wrong. Here we go. <laughs> you're not wrong, mate. And yeah, it's been fantastic. And you think back to the early days yeah. and and where we where we've come now. I mean, you were holding the fort on your own for a month, weren't you? It was just it was just a big Phil show. For the first month, breakfast yeah, time. I, yeah, I suppose so. But yeah, we, we, we've been tremendously lucky in the team that we've got round us now. Do you know what I mean? Including yourself, mate. Because I think it is, it. it is, it is now an effort, and it's a, it's a team effort. Do you know what I mean? And mate, I'm glad it's a mate, team effort. Absolutely, a hundred percent. And that's what I was talking about—the family and people having your back and being well, able I mean, to we've, we've always had this thing at Force Radio where we wanted to build a community. It was well, about being a community. It wasn't necessarily about being a radio station or a podcast no, or anything like that. No. It was about building a community where people could come and they could yeah. interact. Well, that was the whole point, wasn't it? That was the essence, to bring something to the table that you don't see in commercial radio, you don't see out there. I mean, how sad am I that I actually listen to Force Radio? I actually listen to myself. I mean... <laughs> No, I do. I, mate, I, 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 I've, but I've there's drive, nothing wrong with I've, that. I've then. driven a few times. You know, I listen to you. That's even worse. Do you know what I mean? Dude, <laughs> you need help. I'm not the one with this issues. I mean, that Sophie knows me, what she's doing, right? Sophie knows what she's doing. But me and you just no. have absolutely blagged it from day one. Well, that's the thing, mate. You listen to Jason and Wes. They're incredibly professional. Oh yeah, yeah. And they we, must cringe. They they must cringe sometimes listening to us. A hundred percent. I I just like I don't know how I get away with being so close on the edge that that, that I I don't I I'm surprised we're still going, mate. Yeah. No. 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 I, yeah. I think. But that was we, yeah, we were always going to push a few boundaries. Do you know what I mean? And I don't think we push them in the wrong way. Do you know? And no, I think, mate. You know, if it's you look at our competitor, friendly. our only competitor really, which is BFPS, and they're regulated by this, regulated by that. You know, they they have to spade the, say the part in line. You know, a spade's still a spade on false radio for us. And if I see something wrong, I'll call it. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. I think yeah. you know that's taken away from other other news agencies because of the way they the way they're structured. Yeah, a hundred percent, mate. You know, I. I would never go. We we all have different styles. We all have different ways. I I steer clear of of religious, political kind of. Yeah, mate. absolutely. All my, I want, you no, let I, your yeah, hair I want, down. I want feel good. Sometimes I have to mention something if it's really really bugging me. But I'm never going to get caught in a, in a mire of just every day thrashing. Say, for instance, Harry. Let's beat Harry up because we don't like yeah. what he's doing, and let's do yeah. it every day and every opportunity and everything he does. Let's yeah. thrash because I ain't like that. I don't want to do no. that. Do you know what I mean? No, and it's, it's no. negative, isn't it? And negativity breeds negativity. I don't think people want to listen to that. No, I genuinely don't. That that division. Whether or not you're you're that way or or that way, and but the military's very much like that. We don't care, mate. You must have served with with Sikhs and Muslims. Yeah, and, no, and, every, mate, every, it was uh, never an issue. Absolutely, but people don't get. It's the same as the boxing clubs. So I don't see yeah. I don't see any colour, religion, no. creed, sex, or anything. No. All I see is a, a boxer in front of me, a good boxer, yeah. maybe someone yeah. who isn't quite as good at boxing, but they're all boxers. Do you know yeah. what I mean? The same Absolutely. as in the military, we're all we're all so, some you know you've you got officers and you've got men, but you're all you're all under the same banner. So yeah. I don't care what sex you are, I don't care what colour you are. I couldn't give yeah. less a toss what you fancy. Do you know what I mean? That's up to I you. Know. If someone, you know, can if, you fire your weapon straight? Are you going to follow me into battle, or am I going to follow you into battle? Can you do your job? Fine, absolutely. right, let's go. We've got something to work with here, haven't we? Do you know what I mean? 100%. Mate, in, in our day, right, everybody had the mickey taken out of them. Of course they do. If you were tall, you're a lanky streak of... If yeah. you were short, short... If you're from Wales, if you're from Scotland, if you were from Asian descendant, if you were from... Caribbean descent. Every yeah. god body got them. It, you you were all hated <laughs> equally. Yeah, of course. Right? Every, everybody's everybody's. You know, it's just I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> you know you what I mean. Go, 
Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, it's, but, it's definitely... I don't. I think there's still an element of that now, but I think it's just... I don't know. It's, you know, there, certainly when I look at the way the forces are now, they're certainly as capable as they ever were, that's for sure. And I do hear a lot of people going, oh, not in my day, not in my day. But then, if you remember when the SA-80 came in and the old guys would go, oh, I had a man's rifle in my day, and you go, oh, did you really, mate? Did you really? Well, well, we've progressed and we've got something now that's a little bit better. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't better at the start, but you weren't going to no, let them know. No, I was going to say, you know what I mean? now it is better. And they've got all the gear out. and the rails on it, and it's been, t- uh, you know, HK have taken it apart and put it together properly and all that sort of stuff. Now it is better. But the point is, yeah. You've got to roll with what you've got and who you've got there. Do you know what I mean? So it's their army now. It's not mine anymore. It's their no. army. Do you know what I mean? So it ain't mine. So I have to support I have to support them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. A hundred percent, mate. You know, got to move and, with and the te- time. And telling them how and telling them how it's got easier or it's a, or it's not like that in my day isn't gonna help anybody, is it? And no, no actually no, no no one cares. Mate, we've all got wrecked knees and wrecked backs. So <laughs> <laughs> and we're all we're all there. Deaf. We're all partially deaf, mate. <laughs> right, let's just quickly because I'm going well, to wrap this up soon because we don't. Yes, I, I, I'm not on the time. What's your visions for the future? Where would you like this to go now? Where, where where would you like to see yourself in about you know I don't know five ten years time? Within Force Radio. Within what? Well, within life. Anywhere you like. You within know what life. I mean? Wow, I love my job. Love my job. I would do that for the next 20 years. How old am I now? 50. Do I need another 20 years? No, probably not. Probably, I mean, another 50. another, another 10, another 15 to be stretching it. Not saying that you want to retire, but I'd, I'd always have time to do, but I could, yeah. I, I could do that. I could do that. I could do that. <laughs> I, mate, that's where I am right now, work-wise. My kids, well, my youngest, Joel, he's 10. So... You know, another 10 years, the nest might be empty. Kids move out at 20, yeah. I don't know, maybe. But I've got four kids, so the house might be a little bit emptier. Mate, I am so blessed. My life, I, I love I love you. You, you built your dream house, didn't you? You built your dream house. You did, I just we, we didn't go down that rabbit hole today, but you did build your dream house in the end with your missus, didn't you? Exactly. A beautiful house in the middle of a field, in the middle of nowhere. I got my Harley. She's right there. I got my solar panels up, mate. We're nearly <laughs> off grid. <laughs> mate, I, we got our first electric bill today, right? I know we're going completely off a tangent. Our electric bill monthly used to be £175, right? Got our new electric bill and it's £88. And this oh, is in the winter. Going, it's going the this right way. A, it's going the right way, mate. It's only going to get better with the summer. Mate, as for as for Force Radio, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? But I'm there with a family. Whichever way it turns, whichever way we go, rock on, I'd, mate. Super. I would well, look, listen, it's been great to have you on the show. Hopefully we will get back in the studio together at some stage and we can do a few shows together, you know, maybe get on the radio again together, which will be certainly be, it will certainly be good fun. Listen, yeah. for now, I'm going to love you and leave you, buddy. Um, love you, you, mate. you, You're going to have a great weekend with your tremendous family and do your thing. And uh, we'll, you, we'll, we'll see you on the drive. We'll see you on the drive home driving us mad. <laughs> the fruitcake, everybody. He's off. <laughs> I'm out I'll of here. I'll see you later, buddy. Ladies.